Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I uh, come down here this evening to bring to you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the evening uh, comes to a close here in downtown Greenville, uh, around 10 o'clock things will start to calm down more, and I, I seek to preach up until just a few moments before the clock moves over to that time and to make known the gospel friends it is a glorious thing to have the gospel preached in the open air it glorifies God to do so it affects sinners when the gospel it goes forth in the open air Christ is honored his kingdom is furthered on the preaching of the gospel it's the ground upon which the church stands in fact uh, the reformer Martin Luther said that uh, Justification by faith, which is the gospel itself, is the article upon which the church stands or falls. And friends, it is the article upon which you stand or you fall. It is, truly. Friends, I'm out here to plead with you to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone in His finished work. And I will make known to you this evening, by the grace of God, what that finished work is. That is, that He came to die for sinners, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, as we find in 1 Corinthians 15, and that He has ascended to the right hand of the Father as His enemies are being made a footstool for His feet. And I offer before you, my friends, a promise, the promise of life. For Jesus Himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who comes to Me will live even if He dies. Or he who believes in Me will live even if He dies. Friends, I'm here to warn you there are great warnings which I must give you concerning God, concerning your sin, concerning your breaking of God's law, concerning your deserving His punishment upon you in hell. And you must fear God. Friends, it's a command from Scripture that we are to fear the Lord. We must fear God. It is a good thing to fear God. Truly it is. And I plead with you to have a healthy fear of God but to let that push you to look to the grace of God that He manifested in His Son. In His Son. What do we find in Romans chapter 2? The previous chapter. Paul says in verse 4, Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? God's kindness leads sinners to repentance, my friends. God's, God's kindness as it is revealed in His Son. Friends, do not trample God's kindness underfoot. See, God has revealed it in a specific, salvific manner toward His people, but a general manner toward all mankind. In fact, all the wicked even right now this evening. It's a beautiful evening in Greenville tonight. And friends, it testifies to God's grace and God's kindness. That God is a kind God and that He shows kindness even toward the wicked. And friends, you must believe upon Christ. You must believe upon this Christ. Why? Because He is the Lord. He is the King of glory. Prove it. I don't have to. Scripture puts Why it not? forth. Because Scripture you know it to be who? true. It's from, it's from the mouth of God, my friend. From it's when? true. From when? It is true, my friend. It is. From, from when? When? What do you mean, when? When? When, when was this set up for? Well, the Scriptures were written over about a 1,600-year period. 1,600 like, years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for 40-plus authors, three you know different continents. proven dinosaurs to be way before that shit? Mm -hmm. I can give you, I'd love to talk, but I, I need to continue to preach, but no, no, may I give no, you a gospel track? Please, please, please. I, I wish I could, I, I really. Said, no, no, you, you said you'd love, to, you'd love to preach, but I want to know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to know why, what, you know why. Mm -hmm. And as I said, friends, ultimately the preaching of the gospel of Christ brings Christ glory. And so that's my desire is that as Christ is preached, as the message of life is brought forth this evening, it is my desire that Jesus Christ would receive all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. The text of Scripture that I would like to look at very briefly is found in Romans chapter 3. At the end of the chapter, the last verse in Romans 3 in verse 31, Paul says this, Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. And that's what I want to make known this evening. 
The reality that the Christian gospel establishes the law of God. God's precepts, His commands. They are not thrown to the wayside. They are not looked upon in a disparaging manner. Rather, they are established and held forth as glorious. For in the economy of salvation, we know that the law of God serves a specific purpose, and that is to bring to the sinner's attention his dire need for the Savior. Paul puts it this way in Galatians 3. He says that the law is our tutor that leads us to Christ. The law of God points us to our need to believe in the law fulfiller, and that is Christ the Lord. But we ask ourselves, once a man is saved, what does the law have to do with him? And he the law. What is his relation to the law of God now? And what I seek to make known is that he delights to fulfill it. Not so that he might obtain a right standing before God by his religious performance, but that he might please the Heavenly Father who has redeemed his soul from hell. And ultimately I want to consider the gospel message that made such a reconciliation possible. For there is no reconciliation with God outside of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So context here of Romans 3, Paul is discussing the issue of conversion. The issue of salvation. Hey, he's already talked about the work of Christ at the beginning half of the chapter, or earlier on in the chapter, I ought to say. And then he talks about how that's apprehended, how that's brought to the sinner. It's by faith. He says in verse 28, For we maintain that a man is justified, that is, they're made right with God, by faith, apart from the works of the law. That's important. And that is significant. Very significant. It is by faith apart from the works of the law, my friends. He continues, verse 29, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. That brings us to the beginning of verse 31, where he closes the chapter. He closes the chapter with this precious truth that the law of God is established by the Christian gospel. So let us consider that. He says, do we then nullify the law through faith? He's asking the question so that he can continue his argument. He can continue his logical thought here, the flow of his thought. And so he asks the question, do we nullify, that is, do we strip the law of its meaning, of its purpose, of its weightiness through faith? Do we, by saying that salvation is not by the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, strip the law of any value or worth? And the answer is no. For he himself says these words, May it never be. Four emphatic words. May it never be. And sometimes when Paul writes and uses that term, may it never be, in Greek it's meginomai. It's strong. Very strong. It's emphatic. May it never be. In fact, it establishes the law of God, as I said. And that's what he says. On the contrary. So in other words, the exact opposite of such. It does not diminish the importance, the preciousness, the glory of the law of God. Rather, it establishes its beauty. Many Christians, with the right intention, will sometimes negate the importance of the law of God. Friends, God's law is important. For it leads us to Christ. It brings us to Christ. Points us to our need for Him and shows us His fer perfect fulfilling of it. Or I should say points us to His fer perfect fulfilling of it. But not only that, for the Christian it is their delight, it is their joy to obey. See, for those who are truly converted, for those who have been truly redeemed by Christ, it is their joy to obey God. It is their joy to live in submission to the will of God. It's not something they do out of drudgery. It is not something they do because they have to. Hey, thank you, sir. But because they want to. Thank you. It is something that is a joy unto them. And sadly, many people who sit in churches 
care nothing of the law of God, nothing of the things of God, nothing of holiness. They do not delight in the law of the Lord. It is not their meditation day and night. Rather, their meditation is whatever's on TV or what is the next material item that they could possess or the next meal that they are going to eat rather than upon spiritual things. And such people ought not think themselves to be spiritual. It does not matter what they say with their lips. It is how is their life? What is their life like? How does it look? Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 7 that there are many on the day of judgment who will say to Him, Lord, Lord, and he says, I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. That is because these people, though they convince themselves to be in the kingdom of God and born of the Spirit of God, they did not know God. They were hypocrites. What they confessed to possess with their lips, they did not truly with their lives. It's not that we are justified by our works. We are justified by grace. By grace through faith, as Paul says in Ephesians 2.8. But what is the result? What does this precious, glorious, wonderful salvation bring about? A changed life, yes. Changed affections, yes. Thank you, sir. Changed desires. A new heart with new desires. That is the result of conversion. Jesus describes conversion as so radical, He says in John 3, 3, that it is being born again. That's how radical salvation is. It's not some little ritual that someone does and then they're good for the rest of their life. Or they, they just say the prayer, ask Jesus in their heart, like everybody talks about, but it's nowhere in the Bible and they're saved. Salvation is a supernatural work of God whereby He implants new life in a sinner who otherwise didn't have spiritual life, who was instead dead in sin and utterly incapable of reconciliation with God on their own merits of righteousness. Thank you. The Christian, the true Christian's delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 1, verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the, path, in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. What's your purpose? And in whatever he does, he prospers. I'm here to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, What's about, uh, dinosaurs? What about well, dinosaurs? Uh, no, not necessarily dinosaurs, but, but like, what do you hope to get out of what you're doing right now? Is well, yeah, the Bible says that God draws people to Himself through the preaching of the gospel of sure. Jesus Christ. So, uh, and Jesus told His disciples to go and make this, uh, to make this more disciples of all the nations. Dinosaurs, and, though. What about dinosaurs? Well, I'll, I'll answer His question. I'll answer yours. Um, so, and, but why are you here? Like, do you do you hope to convert me, like the person that's been drinking and walking down the street? The yeah, it's whatever. It's whatever. Uh, if God so wills, He will draw those whom He wills through the preaching of His dinosaurs. Son. Dinosaurs. Yeah. So with dinosaurs, the Bible talks about dinosaurs. Absolutely, the Leviathan in the Book of Job. Okay. Yeah, and um, it's interesting. The word dinosaur never hasn't appeared until recently. It used to be people used to refer to them as dragons, but it's in no conflict with Scripture at all, at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. What Absolutely about not. Wearing clothes of different colors or cutting your hair in March. That, that doesn't apply anymore. That was for the nation of Israel. See, people take those verses out of context. That was used for the you nation don't take of Israel. Your verses out of context. What's that? You don't take your verses out of context. No, we study the context, context. historical, cultural, textual context. Those three contexts we have to consider when we look at a verse like that. And so we know that those laws were not given specifically, uh, inherently as a moral law the, these laws were given for the nation of Israel and the purpose was so, so again though what, what, what's your purpose though? You, oh, I just you, said to convert to convert sinners but I'll, to I'll convert. ultimately yeah and God knows that um, Are you calling me a sinner? <laughs> but just as I am we're all sinners absolutely we're all sinners. Uh, yeah. this guy just called me a sinner Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> but Jesus came to save sinners so you can be saved my dear friend you truly can be I was saved from my sin so I, I exhort you to repent and believe the gospel truly Right. To turn to the God whom you know to exist. Can I ask you like a like a straightforward question? Though? Sure, far away. I think it's weird that you're standing on like this little thing right here and reading Bible verses downtown while everybody else is like out drinking and all this stuff. I mean, open, I'm open yeah, yeah, so certainly. Um, a certain interesting question. No, I mean, well, it's interesting because uh, Paul talks about in First Corinthians. He says that God has chosen to use the foolishness of preaching 
to draw people to himself. So the world and people who are in the world look at preaching as foolish. It is a foolish thing sure. in the eyes of the unbelievers. Foolish. Why would I stand here and do this, especially on a cold night? I mean, heard of Bill Hicks. I'm not familiar with the name. No. It's YouTube Bill Hicks. Yeah. He's a comedian. Or, uh, George, or George Carlin. George Carlin. Yeah. Interesting. George. Interesting. Uh, can I give you guys a gospel track before you go? Is, this, is that Absolutely, all right? Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Man. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Listen, I exhort you guys, truly. So you found something you believe in, and you're pushing the boundaries up a little bit, but you, you found something, and that's that's amazing. Thank you very much. You guys have a good evening. May the yeah, Lord bless you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Foolishness of preaching. Foolishness of the message preached as well. Interesting. So going, so going back there to Psalm 1, <clears throat> the true Christian, they delight in God's law. It is their meditation day and night. Friends, I can think back to my own conversion. For eight years of my life, I, I, I'll just say this at the beginning, at seven years of age, I made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I prayed to ask Jesus into my heart, quote and unquote, the evangelical phrase that is often spouted by pastors, but it's nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. But for eight years of my life, I lived as, as lived as a hypocrite. I thought I was converted. I thought I was a Christian. I had said the prayer. I did it. I did what I thought was the biblical thing. And so I was good. It didn't matter really how I lived or it didn't really matter what I thought or it didn't matter that the fact that I was addicted to pornography and I loved to speak in a way that God hated and to watch things and to be entertained by things that I knew God hated. It didn't matter. But it, praise be to God that at the age of 15, I was saved, truly saved from my sin. And I quickly realized something's amiss. Something's amiss in churches. And it's this. This is not preached because it will clear a church out. Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, most of those who claim to be His followers are on the road to destruction. Pastors don't want to say it because they're going to lose their jobs. But this is true. This is truth. It's reality, friends. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit. Nor can a, a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is the state of most church goers and most people who claim the name of Jesus Christ. Especially here in the Bible Belt here in this city that's situated amidst a place that is inoculated with so-called Christianity, but it's not. It's a man-centered, easy believism. It's not Christianity. The Gospel is that Christ came to save from sin, and He came not only to save us from hell, but from the power of sin in this life. Jesus does not save people and leave them to live as though they did before just as they did before. He doesn't do that. What a weak Christ that is. That's a false Christ. The biblical Christ is broad-shouldered and strong. And He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. Friends, and I'll tell you this much, that the power of God for salvation will change a sinner's life. They will turn 180. And friends, this is offered to you this evening. My dear friends, I say that because I care for you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't come out here and beg with, plead with you. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Friends. Dear friends, listen to me. 
The one who loves you tells you the most truth. I'm going to wound you with the truth, but I'd rather do that than comfort you with lies. Than make you more comfortable on the road to destruction. Listen, Christ died for sin. There is power. There is power in the Gospel, friends. And all who come and believe the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are saved from the power of sin and saved from the, the hell that awaits those who are outside of Him. This is the grace of God. Paul says in Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. The Christian gospel does not in any way diminish the value of God's law. Rather, it establishes its value. Because the Christian is now saved made new, born again, so that they would live in obedience to the law of God. Not out of drudgery, but out of gladness, joy, gratitude. What, my friend, would you think if a very wealthy man drove up at this moment on the street and walked down and handed you a suitcase full of hundred dollar bills? You would feel indebted to him. You would feel indebted to Him to serve Him with your life because He gave you a good gift because He was gracious. How much more God Almighty! I cannot believe that sinners have the audacity that so-called Christians have the audacity to say they know Christ and they live with absolutely no gratitude toward the God who supposedly saved them. And how much more valuable is salvation than money? How much more valuable is your soul? My friends, would you sell your eye for a million dollars? How about two eyes for two million? Only a fool would do such a thing to give up his precious sight. Yet what does Jesus say in Mark 9? If your, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. For it is better for you to go into heaven with no sight than to go into hell with sight. Your soul is precious, my friends. So don't lose your soul. Don't lose your soul for your sin. It is worthless. And it does not bring about anything. I plead with you. Don't lose your soul. Hey, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I love Jesus. I spread it with everybody. But just to tell you, my parents, mm, just a little, it turns a little too loud. I know you won't be able to hear you. Well, where are your, par little, your parents? They're, they're over there. But it's just a little... Like walking by, hearing you yelling. I'm a Christian myself, but so I'm trying to speak. it's not I'm trying as to make warm up as I think God would want you to be. Yeah, like and I care people, for people, so I'm going I'm to continue to preach. Thank you very well, much. I'm, Thank you. No, I want you to preach. Obviously, yeah, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I want you to preach. But maybe doing it in a little bit like less of a yelling fashion and more of a warm environment. Yeah, I just, I'm so broken for these people. I'm so, I, I just, my heart is broken. I have to plead with them. Why? What's so, wrong? Why are you so I have to continue sad? to preach though. Thank Why you very much. So thank you. Why are you so upset? I'm not saying thank you, thank you. That heart I gave you. Mm -hmm. Why is he so upset? Um, it's signed Lily. Why is he oh. so Because my name is Elizabeth, but I thought about it. And I, I'm all, I also know, I'm, I'm also known as Lily. Okay, oh, thank so, you. So just so there was not a confusion, it didn't come from Thank you, else. thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm known as Lily, but anyway, mm. I just Thank you, you again. Mm. <laughs> you did, thank you. The Christian gospel establishes the law of God. I apologize, friends. lost my train of thought there. Um, friends, this God who is spoken of in Scripture is holy. He is righteous and just. He is gracious and kind, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands of generations for those who love Him and keep His commandments. Yet Nahum 1, 3, or excuse me, yet Nahum 1, 3 says He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And friends... I will tell you that God has given His law, He has given His decree, His statutes, His ordinances, and your conscience bears witness with this reality that you have broken His law. Ask yourself, have I lied? Have I stolen? Have I dishonored my parents? Have I looked with lust? Have I sinned against the God who has made me? And your conscience shall tell you the truth. The Word of God testifies to this reality, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. for all of sin.
Therefore, we deserve hell. Deserve hell. It's hopeless. There's a hopeless existence outside of the grace of, of God, outside of Christ. But God, being rich in mercy, elected a people to Himself. He elected His church. Ephesians 1, 5. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. Before the world was made, the Father had set out to save a people, to save a remnant. And so when the fullness of the times came, Jesus Christ, the eternal God, came down and took upon Himself the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men. He humbled Himself. He humbled Himself, friends. Philippians 2, Although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He fulfilled the law on behalf of His church died as a ransom for sinners. Upon the cross, Christ bore the wrath of the Father. Upon the cross, Christ cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Upon the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Christ took ownership of the sins of His people. And the Father's justice was satisfied at the cross of our blessed Lord. Paul says, May it never be that I should boast in anything but the cross of Christ. And indeed, may that be the cry of each of our hearts this evening. Christ was raised from the dead three days later, vindicated. And 40 days later, He was exalted in glory at the right hand of the Father on high. He has accomplished redemption. He has accomplished salvation. It is done once for all. The book of Hebrews puts it this way. Hebrews 12, 2, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christ is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek and He is exalted in glory. And He as King has given His decree. He commands all men everywhere to repent and to believe the Gospel. Repentance is simply recognizing our sin, recognizing our rebellion, and endeavoring with full resolve to flee it. And faith is taking hold of the promises of God. Belief is simply that. It is that, that we take hold of the promises of God. We take God at His Word. For He has said thus, Christ came into the world to save sinners. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Verse 18, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Dear friends, inhabitants of Greenville, listen. Listen to this. This is truth. This is true not because I'm saying it. I'm a nobody. Because it's from the mouth of God. It's from the Scriptures. The very Word of God. For all who repent and believe are saved. Repentance and faith are gifts from God Himself. They are not something we can bring about. They are from God. And those whom God chooses to give those precious gifts, those who turn to Christ in saving faith are forgiven of sin, past, present, future, on account of the work of the Redeemer. And they are wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. They are credited with having lived Christ's life. Friends, you must repent and believe the Gospel. Those who come to Christ are credited with having lived Jesus' life because Christ was, having, was, ha was credited as having lived theirs. That's the exchange. Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness. Gift righteousness. All of grace. And not by the works of the law. Not by the works of the law are we justified, but by faith in Christ Jesus. 
For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Over and against the Roman Catholic Church or the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses which say that it is a mixture of faith and human performance when Scripture says it is all of grace. And as I said earlier, for those whom God chooses to save, their life will bear fruit of that reality. They will have a new heart with new desires, new inclinations, new intentions, new affections. They will delight in holiness and in the law of God and in the Word of God. And they will hate the sin in which they once lived. First John 3, 6 No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. The devil, or for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Friends, if you walk in sin, you're of the devil. But if you walk in righteousness, you so prove yourselves to have been born of God. It's not that we are justified by our work, but our work confirms the confession of faith that we make, whether it's valid or not, whether it's true or not. We know from Matthew 7 that a confession of faith means nothing to God if one has no work, if one has no fruit to prove it, Examine yourselves, friends, to see whether you are in the faith. And if so, if you see that Christ is in you, then give glory to God. Praise be to Him for having redeemed your soul. And go and share the Gospel. Christians, please preach Christ and Him crucified. Don't talk about people and their feelings or their aspirations or God has, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Stop it with that nonsense. Preach the Gospel. The gospel of the glory of God. It's about Him and His glory. It is all by grace, free grace, unmerited favor. Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6 to, Tim, uh, to Timothy, verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which He will bring about at the proper time He who is the blessed and only sovereign the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see to Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That's the purpose of salvation and the purpose of all things. The glory of God. So to God be the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you who are lost, embrace Christ Fly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Flee to Him quickly while time is still on your side. If you say that you know Christ, examine yourself to see whether God has truly done a work in you. If not, you need to be saved. If so, praise be to God. Go and proclaim Christ. Go and preach Him to this lost and dying world, my brethren. Go, Christian. Preach Christ. Make Him known. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, that the Christian Gospel establishes the law. For the law brings us to the knowledge of our need of salvation, and for those who have been truly saved, it is their delight to walk in fulfillment of it. Not that they might be justified, but because they themselves have been justified. We have seen how God is holy and righteous, and we deserve hell for our sin. But in His mercy, 
He sent His Son into the world to redeem sinners, to die on the cross, to purchase redemption for God's elect. And He rose up from the grave three days later. And for all who embrace Him, who come to Him, they have eternal life by His grace for His glory. So to the Father, to the Son, to the Spirit, to the triune God, to the one true God be all glory, honor, and praise in all things forevermore. Amen and amen.